Molly, before you leave, I want to congratulate you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now you can go. go I just wanted to acknowledge, and I also want to congratulate all of you who got your 10 years, five years, and so forth. It's really important to have uh, great staff in anything that you do, uh, any organization, particularly uh, an organization like this. I've been involved in the epilepsy movement, uh, of course, since I was 15, but involved in the Epilepsy Foundation for the last 40 years, um, and as a, as a volunteer, and then uh, uh, my co cohort here convinced me that I needed to take over as the interim CEO for the last uh, two months, and uh, I've agreed to do it for six months to a year, and so uh, uh, I am now involved in in a different way. But it's great to be here. Uh, it was a, a little bit of a struggle getting here, but it was it, kind of fun, I will tell you about it. Ginny uh, uh, said that uh, it was uh, important that uh, we be here tonight for, because of some other complications, and so I said yes, so uh, we got a private plane to uh, come on up, and we were told that it would take uh, an hour, maybe an hour and a half to get a car from uh, Alexandria, Virginia, uh, to the airport that we were gonna fly out of. We're in the midst of our national board meeting right now. We had a bunch of meetings today, and we'll continue our board meeting tomorrow. So you've got the chairman of the board and the CEO of the organization here tonight uh, in the middle of these, this board meeting because of what we think of. So that's how important you are to us. Uh, so we get this uh, private plane, get ready, we get the car. Uh, we get in the car at uh, 10 minutes after four in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, we start driving to Manassas, Virginia. And we start driving and we drive and we drive and we drive. And two hours and 45 minutes later, uh, we meet a freight train, and a freight train is going across the highway, and it's taking its darn time. Uh, then that train, freight train goes by, and we start driving again. And uh, we get within five minutes of the airport in Manassas, and we get another freight train that stops us from going. And that freight train, as it gets about halfway through, it stops. <laughs> so we sit there. And we wait until it decides to go again. Now, I'm from a rural area in California, and I know when freight trains decide to stop, they just stop. And so uh, Brian and I are waiting for this freight train to decide to get going. So after about 15 minutes, it decides to get going. So we then get across, we get into uh, the plane, plane's waiting for us. Now it's taken us now three hours to get there. And we get in the plane, and the plane only takes 55 minutes to get here. So we've gone all the way from Virginia to Albany, New York, 55 minutes in the car in Virginia, it takes us over three hours. Um, and we get here and we get in the car and we get here maybe in 20 minutes, I don't know how long it took us, we get here. So we're here, that's what counts, right? But it was an interesting trip. Uh, I just don't want it to take us that long to get back, because we gotta get back tonight because we got a whole board meeting starting early in the morning. So we're gonna get back. Um, I wanted to come and to really uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, it is so important that uh, we reach out to uh, people like uh, Brian and I and Molly and so forth uh, who have epilepsy to uh, reach out to uh, all three million plus in the United States and people to know that we care and that we're involved and that we want to help whenever and wherever possible. That's what the Epilepsy Foundation is all about. Uh, but uh, the national organization is only as good as the affiliates all over the country. Uh, you do the work in this area, and it's critically important 
that we in the national work with you as partners uh, to get the job done that is so critically important. Uh, people like Molly at her age and so forth have to depend upon us to do a better job of communicating and getting things done. So uh, those of you from uh, corporate America that are here that support, it is critically important that you help us get that job done. It is so important that you reach out and help as much as possible, not only with your gifts and your involvement and your participation in the walks and, and this event and other events that the affiliate is involved in, but that you reach out to people that you know and other businesses and corporations and get them engaged and get them involved to make this affiliate that much more effective. And that's what it's all about. So I just want you to know that from uh, those of us, Brian and I, and all the others in the national organization, uh, that we really appreciate what you do and how effective you are. As Brian said, we're here because we know how effective this affiliate is, how good you do and the job that you do, and that you're one of the better affiliates in our operation, and that we appreciate it. Uh, I'm involved because, uh, as Brian said, uh, I have epilepsy. Uh, I started having seizures when I was 16 years old. Uh, my situation is a little different. I was born and raised on a dairy farm and uh, my family uh, didn't accept my epilepsy. When I had my first seizure, I was uh, in a barn actually milking cows. It, it resulted from an automobile accident I had uh, on our family's farm. I was in a pickup and, and somebody else was driving the pickup and we tipped the pickup over in a canal and I hit my head and I had a severe headache and the, I didn't uh, worry about my headache, I worried about the other end of my anatomy because uh, we had just totaled the pickup and I knew what my dad would do to me. Um, and so uh, I had the headache, it got over with and I continued doing what I would do as a 16 year old and milking and going to school and doing all those things. A year later, I was in the barn, and the next thing I knew, I was in the house, uh, 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 passed out. My brother had carried me to the uh, house, and when I uh, woke up, uh, my doctor was uh, uh, sitting on me. Now, my doctor, a little different than Brian, um, in that in those days, uh, uh, I guess, in the little in the country and so forth, that they thought they sat on you when you had a, a severe seizure. Uh, and so uh, I woke up and there I was with the doctor sitting on me and I was frightened, uh, needless to say. And so I asked what's going on and so on and uh, my family said they didn't know. Uh, my doctor had told my family uh, that uh, he thought I was having a seizure and uh, so on and that he thought I had epilepsy, and so he wanted me to go in for tests and so forth. Uh, my family refused to use the word seizure or epilepsy, so they told me that I had to do some tests and so on. Um, and then uh, we went through these tests. They continued to tell me that they didn't know what it was. I then went to a lot of other doctors, and all the doctors didn't know what was going on. See, my family, uh, I'm Portuguese, 100% Portuguese, and my family believed that if you had uh, epilepsy, you were possessed by the devil. Now, uh, I happen to be a Democrat, and my uh, Republican friends think I'm possessed by the devil, but uh, if you have a family that thinks you're possessed by the devil, that's a little different. Um, but for uh, years, I went to all these different doctors, and finally, uh, they decided to give up on medical doctors, and then I started going to witch doctors. And so it was, uh, as a 17-year-old, having somebody go into somebody's home with the lights out and, and, uh, and burn uh, uh, candles uh, on your chest and on your forehead, and pour hot oil on your chest and your forehead, and speak uh, in some strange tongues trying to get rid of the evil spirits was a, a little bit of a frightening experience for a 17-year-old. 
And finally, after going to three different witch doctors and they're not able to, uh, to get rid of uh, my passing out spells, uh, I finally said I wouldn't go anymore. Uh, my parents got very upset and uh, uh, I stopped going and I continued to have my seizures. Uh, my family uh, believed that I was possessed because they were devout Catholics. Uh, the Catholic Church, I found out later, uh, that uh, if you, uh, well, I won't, I won't say that part yet. Uh, so I then went to college. I decided that I wanted to be a, um, a trial lawyer. Uh, so I was finished uh, college, continued to have seizures. Um, and then Kennedy got assassinated, which tells you my age. Uh, Kennedy got assassinated, and I then decided that if he could give up his life for his country, that I wanted to go into public service. My public service, I decided, would be that I would become a Catholic priest. Uh, so I graduated from college and went, uh, wanted to go in the seminary. I went for my physical. Uh, my doctor said, uh, um, have you ever had any passing out spells or headaches? And I said, oh yeah, a lot of them. And he said, well, has anybody ever told you what it was? And I said, uh, no, I, all the doctors I went to didn't know what it was and so forth. He said, well, the tests that I've done on you tell me that you have epilepsy. Well, I'd never heard the word. Um, and he said, um, uh, well, I have some good news and some bad news. 1964, uh, if you have epilepsy, you can't serve in the military, you're 4F. So uh, that's Vietnam. So he said, that's good news, right? So he said, but I have some bad news for you. Uh, you can't become a Catholic priest. And the reason you can't is that in 400 AD, uh, canon law uh, was established that if you had epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a Catholic priest. So you're out of the seminary. Um, well, you know, when he told me that, I was sort of excited. I wanted to be a priest, but all of a sudden I knew what my passing out spells were. So he said, I'll give you some medication that'll either control your seizures or, or you'll, no, and that's why I just take a pill, you know, so that's fine. So I was excited. Now I can go get a job and I'll do, you know, so I, my life would be different. So I called my parents as I left there and I said, I have some great news. Uh, I know what my passing out spells are and so forth. And my family said, no son of ours has epilepsy. And so for 27 years, we didn't have a relationship. Uh, that hit me pretty hard. Uh, I then tried to get a job. And on every job application was the word epilepsy. And I would not lie. Uh, so I checked the box. And all of a sudden, I was student my president in high school, student my president in college, outstanding senior in high school, outstanding senior in college, great grades. And I had a lot of the, a lot of people recruit me to go to work for them when I graduated from college and I decided I wanted to go to the seminary. But I went to these same people at that point and they all said no now because the box was checked. Uh, I started drinking. And I would go on this mountaintop. Now, I was 21 years old and I was drinking and it was Griffith Park in Los Angeles and I don't know how many of you ever been to Griffith Park in Los Angeles, but there are no mountains in Griffith Park. But I was drinking and young, and so I thought everything was big, I guess. And it was actually hilltops in, in Griffith Park, but I went to the hilltop all the time, and I would get drunk by three o'clock in the afternoon. And I became suicidal. Because everything in my life that I'd ever loved, my family, my church, everything I ever believed in, had turned against me. Or so I thought. Then one day, I'm on that mountaintop, and I heard voices that I had not heard before. And I saw a merry-go-round that I had not seen before. 
And there actually was a merry-go-round at the bottom of that mountain at here. And these little kids were getting off and on that merry-go-round. They were laughing and having a ball. And I watched those little kids. And I did something that day that I had never done before and that stays with me to this day. I was 21, and today I'm just about 70. But I said then that I would never ever let anybody or anything ever stop me from believing in myself again. I would never let anybody or anything stop me from doing what I should be doing. And I never have. And from that day until today, I stopped letting people tell me I couldn't do that. And it seemed like, maybe just a few days after that, a priest friend of mine introduced me to somebody that most of you are too young to remember. He introduced me to an individual by the name of Bob Hope and his family. And I went to live with the Bob Hope family for a year. He said to me one day, he said, Tony, your problem is, is that you believe you have a ministry and you think it only can be practiced in a church. The facts are is that a good ministry can be practiced in business, it can be practiced in sports, it can be practiced in entertainment, but a great ministry is in politics. Because you can impact thousands and millions of lives if you do it right. And that's where you belong. I never thought about it, but I was kind of intrigued. So I read, wrote a letter to my congressman who I didn't know, and basically I now have a copy of that letter because the guy who's doing the biography on Bob Hope has that, had that letter, uh, made a copy of it, sent it to me and said, I thought you might like to see what you wrote, Bob Hope, and thanking him for helping him. So I got a copy of it, and it's kind of great to see. But I basically said in that letter, you lucky devil, here I am. Um, and uh, uh, and I, uh, my congressman had an opening, and I went to work with him, and I lived, I mean, I worked for him for 14 years, and that started my political career. Uh, Hope became my mentor, my father, my everything, and then I went to work for this congressman, and he became my second mentor, my congressman, and started my political life. Um, and when, I, when he retired, I then took his spot. He asked me to do that. And I decided that I was going to do everything I could to make a difference in the lives of people with disabilities, and particularly epilepsy. And that's when I wrote the Americans with Disabilities Act that now is the law of the land in 52 different countries, um, and so forth. And I give credit to Bob Hope for guiding me and getting me into this direction. Now some of you might be Catholic. And I want to let you know that I'm a very devout Catholic. But I don't let that experience uh, change my belief in my church and my religion. I just get a little upset with the white men in robes uh, in the Vatican. But let me give you a story about uh, uh, what happened to me and the Pope. When I became um, a whip for the, uh, in the house, uh, I get to go to, the, to different countries. And my first trip, uh, you go to three different countries. And so I decided that I wanted to go to Portugal, for good reason. Um, and the second place I wanted to go to was the Vatican, for good reason. And the State Department picks your third country that you go to on a trip. And they wanted me to go to Morocco, visit with the king, because he was helping us with the Middle East, and Portugal was involved, and so that was the reason for that one. So when I go to the Vatican, uh, I have a delegation with me of seven of my colleagues. And so I have to have a pre-approved speech uh, that you give to the Pope. So by the time it's 
proved it's rather boring and so forth, but when the Pope walks in, he sits down, and I stand up uh, behind a podium, and I give this very boring pre-approved speech. At the end of the very boring pre-approved speech, I say, Your Holiness, I could not live with myself. And at that moment, the minions around the room are going, blah, 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 like, what's he doing? That's not been approved. My delegation is sitting there going, oh no, please. <laughs> uh, my wife at the time is saying, oh, please, please. And I then proceed and I say, your holiness, uh, I have take advantage of this moment because as a young man, I decided that I wanted to become a Catholic priest. And I was denied entry into the seminary because I have epilepsy. And canon law, established in 400 AD, said that if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you cannot be a priest. And I happen to think that's very unchristian of our church, and I hope you would look into it. And I sat down. The Pope then, that was Pope, Pop, Pope John Paul, and if you will recall, if you ever watched him, uh, Sitting there, he would always do this. He'd have his hand on his chin and so forth. And then he would speak and so forth. So when he got up to speak, he gave a very boring speech as well. Um, and then we took pictures and so forth. Um, an interesting thing is that no cameras allowed, but they had a bunch of cameras. And, and, and the, you could buy the pictures at $5 a photo. Um, and we all bought a bunch of pictures, that was to say. And then when uh, when he left the room, uh, my wife and I escorted him to the door, and when he got to the door, he turned around and he blessed my wife, and he turned to me and did not bless me. He turned to me and said, young man, I heard your comments. He turned around and walked off. Now, I was puzzled because I didn't know if that meant that he was mad because he didn't bless me. Or if that was a good sign that he said, I heard your comments. That's all. But I made my point. Two years later, canon law was changed to permit individuals with epilepsy to become priests, and several people with epilepsy are now priests. I do not take credit for it, just to make sure the record is clear. I just know that I made my statement, and two years later it was changed. I hope I had an impact in making that happen but I feel great about the fact that I used the podium to uh, make my comment and that something did occur. So I say that to you because I want you to know that um, I, am, I am devout in, and that uh, even though I felt horrible about what happened, uh, secondly, that I'm aggressive in getting people like Brian to be proud of uh, his epilepsy and to be open about his epilepsy. Uh, I think we all should be and, and that we should try to make a difference. Um, and that uh, I think the only way that we can make a difference if is, is if we speak up and speak out. Um, and that's what I try to do every day of my life. Um, I thank you very much for inviting uh, Brian and I to be here tonight. Uh, and I hope that you've had a a great dinner. Thank you very, very much.